Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Tanya Reinhardt, and I'm the Science Center Coordinator of the UKZN Science and Technology Education Center. And on behalf of the College of Agriculture, Engineering and Science at the University, I would like to welcome you uh, to our public evening lecture series, What Do Scientists Do? Uh, before I introduce our guest speaker for this evening, uh, just some house rules. Please make sure that you have muted your microphone. Um, if you don't know how to mute, at the bottom left, you'll find a microphone and it needs to have a red line across. Please also switch off your camera to save bandwidth, especially now with load shedding going on, there might be a, uh, problems with that. We will have a Q&A session after the talk and you can post your questions in the chat or later on ask the questions live. It now gives me a great pleasure to introduce our guest speaker for this evening. Ursula Schala is currently a full professor at the School of Life Sciences um, at UKZN. She started her university career at the University of Salzburg, Austria, and after receiving a PhD from the University of PE, now NMU, she conducted a postdoc at the Chesapeake Biological Lab, University of Maryland, USA. Thereafter, she worked in the Netherlands, in Wageningen University, and returned to South Africa to take up an academic position at here at UKZN. Her main research interests are that of systems analysis and ecosystem modeling on estuarine, marine, and socioeconomic systems. She enjoys many collaboration in South Africa, Europe, the US, Australia, Japan, and BRICS, and several of them on cross-disciplinary topics spanning economics, mathematics, physics, and social sciences. So you can see fairly versatile. She regularly reviews and fulfills editorial functions for a number of national and international journals and grant evaluations and engages in steering committees and advisory boards nationally and abroad as a member and chair. And it now gives me a great pleasure to leave the stage to Ursula. And Ursula, you're muted, or we can't hear you. <laughs> okay, thank you. After so many uh, Zoom meetings, thanks a lot, Tanya, for the introduction. I'm going to share my screen. And I hope you can see it. In presentation mode. Um, so thank you, welcome everybody, and thank you for attending the seminar at this time uh, of the day. Uh, thanks to Sally Frost and Tanya Reinhardt for organizing it, and thanks for to you, KZN, for giving me the chance to talk today. So the talk is about uh, systems thinking in natural and in socioeconomic systems. Um, and it is about why this is an this is something important and why we should have more of it, at least in my opinion, and I hope I can convince you. Uh, my background uh, is marine ecology. Uh, I also work in systems modeling, and that uh, that sparks my interest in in more types of systems than uh, just natural ecosystems. Uh, so I will talk about uh, a bit about natural and socioeconomics and the uh, brief, outline of the points that I'll be um, dealing with. So first, of, uh, why do we actually uh, deal in systems? Why do we, I'm not sure if you can see me like that too, let's put it away. Um, then a little bit about marine and estuarine ecosystems and their ecology and ecosystem services. Um, I wanna tell you what this has to do with socioeconomic systems that brings me briefly to sustainable development goals and uh, planetary boundaries, the hot topics of the decade. And uh, then towards the end, where to from here once we've uh, sort of outlined um, uh, our import, the importance of systems. All right, so uh, starting with my systems, sorry, let me just uh, also hide this. Um, so everything, every living thing is part of a system, right? So here's a picture of an estuary. We have nearly 300 of those along our coastline. And within these estuaries, there are hundreds of species uh, from very, very small to very, very large, like this crocodile here. And uh, they live all together 
in this ecosystem. If you go to the marine environment, we find different types of species, but they all occupy the space together in the system and interact uh, to some extent. So in food web species interact uh, and with, with one another and they also interact with the environment and that makes the ecosystem. Um, here in this uh, in this depiction of the ecosystem, we actually have connections between the species. Okay, so that shows us this interaction. And basically, it, every we have a lot of feeding interactions. For instance, here these large adult fish they feed on the smaller fish, and they feed on the zooplankton, and that in turn feeds on the phytoplankton. Um, and so we can um, we can uh, show that no species. Um, exists in isolation. Okay? So species, of course, they consume and they grow and they reproduce, but they do not exist in isolation. Um, here, quite an old picture of a food web and um, the, it was the ironic title, the Simplified Food Web of the Northwest Atlantic. It's, it's um, quite an old drawing by now. And it shows you that there are a lot of connections. Why it's, it's not simple, but it's simplified, which means any of these uh, these boxes here, they could be further divided into more species and that would give us uh, more, even more connections. Uh, but what it shows us is that is the tremendous amount of interactions in the ecosystem, you know, further, um, further supporting that we actually, it does not make sense to look at one species in isolation. Um, we also have interactions across ecosystems. This for, instance, in, this, for instance, is an estuary that's been flooding, and we see the plume out at sea. So there's a nutrient input into the adjacent ecosystem. And when the estuary floods, then also everything that sits in the estuary is uh, transported out to sea. Now, when this flooding stops and the tide um, enters the estuary, then, of course, we have, again, uh, the connection from the marine ecosystem to the estuary. Um, we also have species that connect ecosystems. So here, for instance, is a map of, uh, of turtles that have been tracked. They connect islands. They connect islands amongst each other and with the marine ecosystem. They connect islands with the, with the coast. And then we also have further uh, nutrient subsidies, for instance, here from a mangrove forest. This is mangrove leaf litter here that one sees that is transported into the near shore and provides nutrients for that ecosystem. Um, in economic systems, we have something fairly similar. So here's a map of the world and world trade systems and how countries interconnect with each other. So you see there are also a whole lot of interconnections. So companies interact with each other. Companies do not work in isolation, like species also do not work in isolation. There's always some connection uh, to some other company uh, in another country or maybe within countries. And here, for instance, the system of our, of our internet uh, sea cable provisions uh, or just around Africa, basically. But the point is, since we work, we are able to work in systems, we can actually achieve something in addition to uh, as if we would uh, not do so. And this is a really, really important point, not only of ecosystems, but also of social systems and economic systems. So this, this uh, working together of the parts is very, very crucial. And social systems. Also, here is a, as a map of Facebook interactions, and uh, people, yes, have are their own entities and have their own devices, but then interact quite extensively with each other and form friend groups, right? So that is the the new thing that comes out of this interaction. Okay, so the interactions. Um, also have the consequence that we see something on a systems level that we wouldn't otherwise see uh, from just the part of the system. For instance, what are then what are these system level phenomena? And uh, is this working together? For instance, uh, we couldn't have um, <clears throat> I don't know honey production if we wouldn't have a beehive. So one bee wouldn't be able to do all of that that a whole beehive can um, can accomplish. And so this working together 
really brings us something new. So because there is this working together in systems, we get so-called system services. And since we deal with natural systems, in ecology anyway, uh, we get so-called ecosystem services. And the ecosystem services are those um, uh, benefits that we can reap from ecosystems. For instance, <clears throat> we can harvest the fish. Uh, we have a system that absorbs CO2. Uh, we can enjoy it as a tourist. Uh, we have species in there that, uh, that deliver us compounds for medicine and so on. So we have that the natural ecosystem can make an amazing amount of provisions to us but providing there's a working together of the parts of the system, and as we will say late, will, as we will see later, also providing that this working together is in some kind of balance. Um, so here, for instance, <coughs> um, marine ecosystem services. Uh, for instance, if we look at the regulating services, we have carbon storage, so the ocean can absorb an amazing amount of CO two. We have storm protection, for instance, from mangroves or coral reefs. Uh, we have uh, waste breakdown. So all the waste that we dump at sea gets uh, broken down to various extents um, because of the food web in the sea. We have climate uh, and temperature regulation. For instance, if we didn't have the ocean absorbing all this heat, we wouldn't, there would be no reason to talk about a 1.5 degree target because we would have passed it long ago and we would already be a couple of degrees warmer. Uh, we have, for instance, here, just to, to point out a few others, larval and gamut supply, for instance, for agriculture. We have uh, nutrient cycling, again, something that helps us uh, partially getting uh, rid of um, waste that we put in and also uh, fueling the food webs. We have sand and gravel provision for, for building and so on. So numerous, numerous services that we get. Uh, and we get them because the ocean is a system. All right. So individuals of species, they they the, the consequence is that they cannot survive without the system, right? So a species is very is very much embedded in the system, and certain species also can't survive with other species. Mutualists, for instance, sorry, um, uh, for instance, trees and the the mycorrhizae, the fungi at the roots, or corals and the sous centelli. So they are very interdependent species. But overall, if we look at the ecosystem, then we have three major categories of uh, species. And the first two we could almost put into one because these are the autotrophs that make uh, organic compounds from inorganic compounds. And they are uh, sort of the, the first order producers or primary producers. And then we have the heterotrophs, including us, that feed on those and feed on each other. And together they are arranged in a food web. And so this is the picture we saw before. And one of the big questions in ecology is how does a food web or an ecosystem persist over time? So how does it manage with all the different species that are in there that are all doing their thing and are all interconnected? How do they actually manage to persist over time? And when we look at ecosystems, the different species that we have, they are um, of very, very different size. So for instance, the phytoplankton is really, really small. It's only one cell big. And the biggest ones, we have whales. So there are orders of magnitude of size difference in there. And because they have such a different size, they grow at very different rates. So we have tremendously different growth rates, which means they also eat, um, consume very different amounts of energy. And even so, somehow this whole uh, system with hundreds and thousands of species keeps in balance. And this is actually quite a remarkable thing. And uh, this is often something that we try to reproduce in economic systems that are not uh, quite so successful uh, with it. So if we stay at ecosystems for now, so each species has a certain productivity and uh, it produces biomass and then a predator eats that biomass. And so this is how the food web can exist. And the smaller species, they have a much higher productivity 
than the larger species do. For instance, phytoplankton grows much faster than a fish does. <clears throat> and if we um, if we put this, I found this nice slide, uh, to, how to earn a, a tuna sandwich. So for if I start at number five here, so for each kilogram of tuna, uh, I need about 10 kilograms of mid-sized fish. So the tuna com consumes that much fish. And those mid-sized fish, they need about 100 kilograms of small fish. And uh, those 100 kilograms of small fish, they need about 1,000 kilograms of small herbivores. So the, this would be the zooplankton that feeds on the phytoplankton. And the, these 1,000 kilograms of zooplankton, need, they need about 10,000 kilograms of primary producers. Yeah. So just to get to one kilogram of tuna, I need 10,000 kilograms of primary producers or 1,000 kilograms of, of, of zooplankton. And this is a huge difference in, in biomass. So there are order, orders of magnitude. We started one here, 10, 100. We have five orders of magnitude difference between the tuna and the, and the phytoplankton. And they have vastly different growth rates. And somehow this works out so that they, at the end we can go fishing and actually get the tuna from uh, all this uh, interconnected food web. So just a, a side note, this is a very nice um, sort of textbook example uh, that we have always a one to 10 difference between those uh, steps. It's not always one to 10 in reality, so it can actually be quite different. Uh, but <clears throat> anyway, for now, uh, this is uh, this is quite a nice example to illustrate. All right. So when we when we have this different types of type of productivity of all the species in the food web, uh, it is arranged so that all the species can exist uh, with each other. And here is a small food web um, to illustrate how that, that we have this, this like energy flow through the food web. So the predator eats some of its prey and all the energy that flows around in this food web can be accounted for. So there is no, there is no energy that somehow disappears somewhere, but it always goes somewhere to some use. And there's an energy balance in ecosystems. So what a, what a, a species consumes, it uses for its metabolism or for reproduction. What it doesn't use is excretion that goes again to the detritus pool, to the nutrient pool of the food web. And uh, we can uh, we can do some energy accounting in the food web. So what whatever is consumed by a species is also uh, produce leaves it again in various forms. So if you if you are that inclined, you can see that what goes in here, those 41.47 is the sum of those 0.51, the 15.79 and the 25.16. So this is all uh, accounted for. All the energy that flows in here is accounted for. And the, the major point is there are no garbage bins, no landfills, no waste disposal sites in nature. And this is Firstly, because all this energy is accounted for and because of this recycling that happens on a grand scale. So here, just one example of a mangrove tree that loses its leaves uh, and the leaf litter is consumed by larger species here, a crab and a snail that break it down into smaller pieces. And uh, that is then consumed by smaller consumers that break it down further again. And then eventually through the microbial loop, uh, the nutrients are remineralized um, to inorganic nutrients so that the tree can use it again. And there are numerous of these recycling cycles in a food web <clears throat> that takes care that that we with this energy accounting that we that, that there's nothing left over and nothing lost. So this is one of the major uh, major differences to economic systems, as you are aware. Okay. So this, this working together in the ecosystem that, uh, that makes sure that we can use the ecosystem services. Okay, So one of the ecosystem services is not just something that we harvest, but actually that whole process in, in the food web that produces what we harvest. So the whole food web already is 
an ecosystem service and that produces, for instance, the fish or whatever we want to harvest. Okay. And um, and this can only happen if that um, if that productivity and the this and how the species eat each other is in some kind of a balance. Um, so that that one to ten that I that I talked about here, I said it's not always one to ten. There is a lot of variability in that. And of course, food webs are not always the same and species are not always the same. Sometimes they grow faster and sometimes they grow uh, not so fast. We have differences between summer and winter or dry and wet seasons, for instance. But we can also bring it out of balance uh, by removing things from the food web. For instance, if we fish a lot or by adding things to the ecosystem, for instance, invasive species or pollution, then we also bring this this uh, this um, working together out of balance, and this is how we actually threaten the ecosystem services that we uh, <clears throat> expect from the ecosystem. All right. So if we disrupt productivity at any level in the ecosystem, uh, then uh, we jeopardize the the ecosystem services. So this is a very famous picture in ecology, and I think every ecologist probably knows this. Uh, it's called Fishing Down the Food Web. It was uh, first uh, made um, uh, famous by Daniel Pauly. And it has it says basically that we fish out the top predators. And when we do so, then, we, then they're gone uh, mostly. And we are left with the mid-sized or smaller sized fishes. And we are lower down the food web. So that's um, fishing down the food web. And um, the loss of top predators, you may think, well, you know, if the top predators might not be so nice to eat, but but what other effect would it have? For instance, the top predators are very important also in the recycling of nutrients in a food web. And we can disturb a food web at any level. So we can uh, we can um, create almost different kind of food webs through the disturbance. One of the major ones that we talk about now is, of course, climate change. So some species may, may move because of climate change to environments that, uh, that are better suited for it, or they may go extinct, uh, or other species might uh, proliferate. And that also changes the food web. And we don't know yet for every place um, on the coast and the ocean how this might work out, although there are many scenarios for many places um, to, uh, to have a look how this could pan out. All right, so one of the really important statements of this is, I think, is that one species alone cannot provide an ecosystem service, okay? So it's not possible for one species to do that, even if we fish that one species of fish or that harvested one species of mussels. So the the, there is, of course, we also want to look at the, we need to know how a species in itself work, works. So the characteristics of the species in terms of its um, uh, habitat preference, in terms of phys its physiological performance, for instance, how well it grows is important to know. Also important to know is uh, how the species inter is in the context of other species, how it interacts with them and in the context of changing uh, environments and how it then performs over time. So that's also important to know. And um, besides providing the context for a, spe a single species, ecosystems tell us a bit more about uh, the species themselves also. So this is also a famous um, um, picture for ecologists. And um, this uh, it tells us basically how a food web can be disrupted. And these are two extreme cases. Um, one is called bottom up and the other one is called top down. So on the left hand side, the bottom up, it tells us that if we decrease the phytoplankton over time, so the horizontal axis would be time, then the food, uh, the, sorry, then the grazer, the, those that eat the phytoplankton will also decrease over time. And those fish that feed on that zooplankton will also decrease over time. And those uh, predators that feed on those fish will also do so. And uh, 
if uh, something changes on the top of the food web, for instance, we fish out, um, I don't know, some top predators, then they will get less over time. It means their prey will increase over time. And because there's now more of those fish, they eat more and their prey will decrease over time because they're less here, they will eat less and therefore the phytoplankton will increase over time. So usually we have sort of a mixture between those two. These are really very extreme uh, cases and it might flip towards the one or the other side. What we also have though, besides those direct effects is indirect effects. So this means the phytoplankton can indirectly affect the top predators uh, and the top predators can indirectly affect, for instance, the zooplankton. And it, in ecosystem, actually the indirect effects are much, much more prominent than the direct effects. So it's really important to, um, to take those into account when one, when one makes any assessment of how well or not an ecosystem works or how healthy or not, <clears throat> it appears to be. All right, so we, without a functioning ecosystems, we don't have ecosystem services. And to translate this, no fish on your plate without the species or the biodiversity interacting in balance. So if we bring it out of balance, then we do not have, um, and then we can't reap the ecosystem services that we want to. And that brings me to uh, the blue economy that is that has risen in prominence during the last years very sharply and uh, basically it comes from that we haven't exploited the ocean yet as much as we have exploited terrestrial environments. And uh, we want to make better use of those ecosystem services that uh, than we uh, did in the past. Of course, there is a fair amount of conflict, but even so, uh, we need to remember that if the ecosystem doesn't function, we actually can't do so, right? So there is also no blue economy without functioning ecosystems. Yes, we can still drive a ship through the ocean, whether the ecosystem functions or not is then irrelevant but we can't fish, we can't have uh, storm protection, uh, we, we can't have many other things uh, if we don't have a functioning ecosystem. So this, is, this really underpins the economy rather than sort of being something that we should uh, seek to preserve while we exploiting the uh, ecosystem. Uh, it's, it's really more than that. All right, so ecologists, of course know that things work together and that in a system everything is in interconnected. Um, ecology is the science of the relationship between organisms and the surrounding environment and the discipline of ecology is quite old already, it's more than 100 years old, so already in the late 1800s there was in, uh, something like ecology. In recent years and decades so many other disciplines have sort of rediscovered ecology for themselves. Uh, and uh, that is quite interesting for uh, here are a few examples. For instance, here, the ecology of law, uh, subtitled toward a legal system in tune with nature and community. So the, the um, important word here is in tune with. So that implies again, this balance that uh, is sought after uh, to, to make a new system of law that uh, serves society better. Here, another one, political ecology, climate crisis, and a new social agenda. Okay? So we're not happy with the present social agenda and a new social agenda, or even for businesses, ecosystemize your business. So it actually goes to such an extent that... Um, if one steps a little bit out of the ecology discipline, one actually all of a sudden has to uh, change one's own terms. So using ecosystem as we used to as ecologists is not, um, is not enough anymore. Actually, one now needs to write about natural ecosystems, which is uh, was for me at least um, a step to be clear about what one talks about. But uh, overall, that this this ecology and ecosystem terms are um, used much more by by other disciplines 
I think is a really good uh, good thing. It tells us that people start leaning towards system thinking uh, and going away from sort of uh, thinking just about the isolated parts of the system. And as I will point out, thinking about the isolated parts uh, is something that uh, brought the economy or our economic system um, or made it less successful than it perhaps could be. So it is a good thing to to um, to borrow concepts from ecology and their ecology can can actually provide a good service to other disciplines in terms of this this interconnected thinking. Okay, so that brings me to economics and how does it relate actually to natural ecosystems. So the, the world's predominant economic philosophy at the moment is that of capitalism in one form or another. So the different forms. And just to point out uh, uh, a feature of capitalism, I got this, um, this uh, definition from Wikipedia. And just to read one sentence here, uh, or one and a half, so that we get to the important points. Capitalism is an economic system based on the private ownership of the means of production and the operation for profit. So that for profit is very important. Central characteristics of capitalism include capital accumulation uh, and other things. And capital accumulation here is an important term. And, and the, because the system is laid out like that, that the goal is profit uh, or uh, you know uh, increasing profits and this accumulation uh, we have a measure of economic systems that you all know the gdp or the gross domestic product and that is a measure of the monetary value of the country's goods and services that are produced in a in a certain amount of time yeah? so this is our one and only very, very prominent measure. There are also others, of course, but they're not nearly as prominent or widely used as this one. And, and we know that wealth is very unequally distributed uh, across the globe. Here's a number of 62% uh, of the GDPs in countries that only have 16% of the world's population. And everyone looks at this, of course, one thinks this is completely out of balance. Okay? And the question is, how how did we get there and how do but perhaps the more important question is how do we get away from that and get to a more balanced uh, system so how does one actually how does the economic work so how does one earn a lot of money or oh, and thereby increase the gdp as a country so one is of course to run your business well but the other one is to keep costs at a minimum so for instance wages and a really important one is to externalize the costs. So if you have costs in your system, but you don't want to report costs, uh, then you put them outside your system, you externalize them. And that means that in an, in, in an economic assessment, the environment is externalized. So that means only part of the economic system is taken into account. So basically all economy is based on uh, the ecosystem, maybe directly, or maybe a few steps away, but nevertheless, it is based on, on some, some uh, part of the ecosystem, but it is not taken into account, it is externalized. And um, a practical example, for instance, you, you might know this graph, there are two lines, one is about the total energy use, and here that is in million tons of uh, oil equivalents and the blue one is the GDP and they go together. So the more fossil fuels we use, the more GDP, the, the more the GDP rises. Right. So this, so if we measure the economic wealth in terms of GDP, then we say, oh, this is looking great because the GDP is rising. So the costs that we externalize then are the impacts of the fossil fuels. Okay, so the impacts on the natural environment, for instance, through ocean acidification, extreme weather, sea level rise, plastic pollution. So plastic, of course, from the fossil fuels, air pollution, water pollution, oil spills. Uh, and here is one about people too. And that's health issues of people, not of uh, any, other, any other creatures. So this is meant by externalizing. So the impacts, uh, externalized. These are the costs. 
right? So if we would include these costs in the blue line, then the blue line wouldn't rise, but it would go, I don't know, straight or go down. I'm not sure exactly where it would go, but certainly it wouldn't rise. And this is, uh, this is one of the major faults uh, of the economic system, at least now that we realize eco uh, ecological resources are not unlimited. Okay, so the consequence of this is that we do actually not pay for ecosystem services, right, uh, in, in our economic systems. And what does this mean? For If we come back to our, to our tuna example, we do not pay for the food web that does all this work to produce this tuna. Okay, so we pay for the fishing, for that whole supply chain, uh, for the transport and so on, till that fish lands in the shop where we buy it or on the plate uh, in the restaurant. Uh, we do not pay for pollination of crops. Okay, we pay for the farming costs and again for the supply chain, uh, but not for uh, the actual pollination. Uh, we do not pay for um, uh, water ecosystems, aquatic ecosystems to clean our effluents. Okay, so we dump the effluent, but then we leave it. So we don't, we just expect the ecosystem to deal with it, which it does to, depending on how much we put in. Uh, we don't pay for bioremediation. So this is a photograph of an oil spill. And of course, humans clean it up to some extent, but one can't clean up everything. So the rest uh, is accomplished by the ecosystem, the rest of the cleanup. But we actually do not pay for it. Okay, And these, uh, these are, of course, huge ecosystem services that we use. And our economy, therefore, wouldn't run as it does if we wouldn't use the ecosystem services. All right, so the consequences of this is one is extreme wealth gain, even if it's only for part of the of the uh, globe, but the wealth gain is extreme. Um, then we have a high turnover economy with cheap resources, so natural resources and labor, and extreme exploitation and degradation of the natural environment. So these are the consequences of how we run it. And because the overarching measure is the GDP. Okay? So we actually have something equivalent to that in natural ecosystems. And that uh, is the energy, the amount of energy you put through the system. But I'll explain later that it's actually not a very good one to use for ecosystems. And it's actually also not a good one for, for economic systems. Uh, and also because of these, I realized that these two are the same as there. But yes, it's also a cause. And um, and one last one I want to point out here is not taking the production rate of the resources into account. So we don't take into account, for instance, when we put effluents into the rivers and the sea, that the that these ecosystems can deal with a certain amount of effluent, but not with more. Okay. So we don't when we fish, we we yes we try to estimate how much we can fish without a negative impact. Um, but of course we fish more and therefore disrupt uh, or, or not take into account the production rate um, in, in, um, appropriately. Okay, but also in the economic literature, uh, there is um, 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 a recognition that GDP is not uh, a good indicator and not an accurate measure of economic process. Uh, even to the extent that uh, these uh, headlines forget GDP. Um, and, uh, and here I want to link it back to ecosystems. So they're, they're like there's a food chain on the, on the left and, and some ecosystem on the right. And the one on the left is really efficient. This is what we want economic systems to look like. Okay, Very efficient, no losses along the way, and maximum profit. Um, this is what ecosystems look like, less efficient. So we have not the maximization of profit in mind here, but we have in mind that we have a stable uh, system. Uh, so if we, for instance, look at, at this system is a very, it could be very unstable if we have a disruption, for instance, we just need to lose one of these um, nodes or one of these links and then the rest is disrupted. Here, if we are at this 
this uh, first node here, we have four different ways we can go. So if one of them is blocked, it actually doesn't matter because we can still uh, go the other. So a much more stable and resilient system on this side. And I will use these two figures in some of the subsequent slides uh, also. So this brings me to the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDG and planetary boundaries, and um, how we could perhaps use those to turn around our economic systems by viewing them more in an integrated system. So you all know the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, there are 17 of them. They are there to to assess the current state of natural and human well-being and, and serve as a framework to improve, uh, <clears throat> improve uh, the current state. So if you, if you look at those 17, there are two that um, talk to the natural resources, 14 and 15, life below water and life on land. And all the other ones basically are uh, uh, human related. So clean water and sanitation is in one. Of course, clean water comes from, uh, is also a natural resource. Um, and the climate in a way is also a, a natural resource, but they're also there because we are impacting those natural resources um, quite a lot. So when these uh, SDGs were initially uh, postulated, one did not think so much about how they would interact. Okay, so for instance, number eight here is um, economic growth, and one didn't uh, spend a lot of thought how this would impact actually the natural resources. Yeah, and so basically all these SDGs interact, and only in recent years um, one sees these uh, these titles connecting the SDG dots through systems thinking. So actually to view them as a system and interacting of interacting parts. So they all interact with each other to some extent. And um, and here, for instance, a, uh, quite a highly cited paper, the contradiction of the sustainable development goals, growth versus ecology on a finite planet. Yeah? So where, where people actually realize, oh, um, actually we, we might not be able to achieve them in a way that we thought because we may run out of resources to do so. And interestingly, those, those resources here, 14 and 15, uh, and here also the clean water and the climate, they underpin the, the whole economic system and, and the society. So all these other developments that we want for human well-being, they rest on these uh, natural resources. So again, if we don't have functioning ecosystems, then we actually uh, cannot achieve the development goals because we cannot. Uh, we can. There is no. There are no resources for achieving them. All right. So then that brings me to planetary boundaries. Um, I'm. I'm not sure how. I, I quickly explain what they are. So they. Um, they exist since the concept uh, was developed by the Stockholm Resilience Center, uh, basically, and uh, affiliates and. Uh, they exist since about 2009, um, and they're updated. Uh, there's, it, they're still not um, finished. I guess the, you know, the more data come in, the more one thinks about it, the better one can make this concept. And uh, they are a global assessment, and they are here to assess boundaries for continued human existence, basically. So you see here in green, this is called the safe operating space. Uh, of the of uh, the Earth, so this is this is the globe here, and then as we go towards the oranges and the red, then we have overstepped these boundaries. Uh, I quickly uh, go through what these nine are. So the novel entities are novel novel things that we make, chemicals and so on that we that we uh, produced over the years. So we have overstepped it. The ozone depletion we actually did manage to reduce. Uh, aerosol loading, we're still in green, ocean acidification, we're in green, approaching the boundary. Then these biogeochemical flows are nitrogen and phosphorus, agriculture, for instance. Um, uh, then we have freshwater uh, change. So there's something called blue water and green water. Blue water is the water in, in rivers and lakes and ice caps and so on, green water in, that's in plants. Land system change, how we transform the landscape. 
the biosphere integrity, so that is divided into genetics, so how many species we actually have, and into functional, so whether we actually can fulfill functions in the ecosystem, is working together of the different species to, for instance, produce the tuna. Uh, we've overstepped those boundaries. And then climate change, the CO2 con concentration and the radiative uh, forces. So the SDGs and these planetary boundaries are sort of frameworks that we can use to uh, to assess where we are and to uh, to you know make uh, make better decisions about how we use natural resources. Okay, then where to from here? So this this um, systems thinking we established is important once because processes are not. Uh, reversible as for instance we might think of as, as engineering or other simple mechanic systems we have emerging properties from systems and uh, one important point that I'm going to talk a little bit about is systems persist due to opposing for forces striving for efficiency and for inefficiency so the striving for efficiency that is so so key to our economic systems is not necessarily the best thing to do and uh, uh, a, a brief step into history at Newton's time, uh, one would say nature is a perfect machine explainable by exact mathematical laws. Now we know it's not like that, but of course uh, this, this was the thinking at the time. And in the age of the scientific revolution, we actually had a very prominent mechanistic worldview. And that was that all material things can be explained in terms of the workings of the smallest parts. It means you can take apart everything. And once you know how the parts work, then you know how the system works, which we now know is not the case. So this, this uh, is also a very widely used picture. The duck that is um, depicting here is, is a mechanical duck. So seeing or wanting to convey if we know all the parts how the parts work of a duck work of a duck then we know how the duck works but of course it is not like that okay so this is ascribed to the cat who also gave us the uh, cartesian uh, plane just as an aside and um, that that going towards the systems thinking from that mechanistic world we started in the early 20th century and in the discipline of ecology and that's not surprising because they one knows that things hang together and that they that they interact with each other. Um, so the, the phenomena that we get cannot all be explained by just analyzing the parts. And and one one picture of me using lectures, for instance, is this one: that if we have hydrogen and oxygen atoms we couldn't predict that we get something like water if we put them together. Okay? So only if we have water molecules, uh, when then we uh, know that we have that. And, and it is like that with many other things. For instance, we can, we can follow in the brain. We know what the brain consists of. We know there are going ions in and out through me uh, membranes, but how does consciousness arrive? So these are these are sort of kind of systems questions, and it also implies that physics is not the most fundamental description of reality. There are also other things like these emerging systems phenomena uh, that uh, that uh, we see in reality. Okay, so we sh shift our perspective from the parts to the whole. Although, of course, we do want to know how the parts work, like we do want to know how fast the fish grows, for instance, but we also want to know how this works in the entire ecosystem. And uh, and if we look at the whole, at, uh, for instance, at that water molecule, that also implies we cannot just take it apart and then see how the system works, because as soon as we take it apart, like in this water example, we again arrive at the atoms and we don't have the water. So by taking it apart, we actually lose the thing that we uh, want to uh, want to investigate. Right. So this is uh, Donella Meadows that many of you might know. She was the lead author in the Limits to Growth at the Club of Rome in the 1970s already that uh, sort of warned of the overexploitation of nature and, and uh, the economic system at the time and and uh, saying the world is a complex interconnected finite 
uh, system of many different uh, uh, parts. We treat it as if it were not, as if it were divisible, separable, simple, and infinite. Our persistent and tractable global problems arise directly from this mismatch. So again, um, a plea towards uh, viewing the system as a system and not dividing it up into the parts first. Um, so to the question, how do systems persist over time quickly? So we have this opposed, these opposing forces striving for efficiency. This is the one prominent in economy and inefficiency. So we, we actually, we don't uh, only have efficiency, also inefficiency. And when we look at this food web here, so some, uh, some uh, consumers, some species are very large, they consume a lot. And so we have very strong feeding links. So these are these big feeding links here. And then some species populations are very small. They feed very little. And we have small feeding links. And these are four ecosystems here. They're all, if we order them from largest to smallest, they all look like that. This is, so this is reproducible over ecosystems. And what it implies is that we have uh, 10 to 20% of these connections that transport 80 to over 90% of the energy through the system. So then you might think, well, why do we need actually all these other connections? Why can't we just take those most, those highest ones because they will feed the, the put the energy through? Why do we need actually all those others? Um, so why can't we have a system uh, on the left here, the very efficient one, why do we need to have the less efficient one? And as I explained before, it's about that uh, stability that we need. So in case we lose a link or a node in there, we have other pathways that we can go. So we we need some efficiency to get the, the energy up to the higher trophic levels, but we need those small links, those many pathways to uh, maintain some flexibility to keep the food web persisting over time. So if we have variability in the production rates and the feeding links, that we can actually buffer that to some extent. Uh, and this we can we can actually um, show in this in this figure. So if we have sustainability, so persistence over time, yeah, then uh, we need some balance between efficiency and resilience. If we go, if we have a lot of efficiency, we decrease the sustainability. Uh, if we have a good balance, we increase the sustainability. And this is actually when when we look at ecosystems, this is actually where they are. They are in this highest sustainability. So if we look at our two uh, two food webs here or two systems here, then the one with the chain would is very efficient, but it's not sustainable. It's very low on here on this axis here, whereas this one is efficient. Uh, sorry, whereas this one is less efficient and and has a high sustainability. So if we go to the economy, then we uh, we know that we have some really large companies. Okay, so for instance. I don't know what, what exactly the numbers were, but about 70% of the global food production is in the hands of, I don't know, eight to nine companies. Okay, So this is a very efficient system, but not a very resilient system. So if we are on our sustainability curve, then th we would be here for the food production company. Great efficiency, not very sustainable. And what also happens if we get big companies uh, and we get that... Uh, then we get something called the Walmart effect that you may have heard of, so that big companies draw more resources towards them. And why is it called the Walmart effect? So that is a big company that started out uh, in the US and when wherever a Walmart moves in, smaller businesses close, uh, so that reduces the diversity. Um, uh, people are unemployed, maybe get employed at Walmart, but not that many, and uh, and we have Walmart getting ever, even bigger, drawing even more resources towards that. So many big companies are bad for small businesses. Sorry, few big companies are bad for, uh, for small businesses. And we go even more towards this greater efficiency 
and lower sustainability. In ecosystems, uh, we might also get an imbalance, okay, if we, especially if we mismanage. Here, an example from St. Lucia of two places in St. Lucia. Here, two food webs, one for each uh, place in St. Lucia of a fairly healthy food web. And because of drought and partially mismanagement, we get a food web like this. So if you see the difference, I go, I go back again. Uh, it, it, we lose species, we lose connections, we go towards greater efficiency, but also lower sustainability. I don't see. All right. So to summarize the tools of a systems thinker, basically we go from separate parts to a system, to relations, to synthesis, uh, to interconnections and so on. And one important one also is that leaving the linearity, like not going for maximization of profit, for instance, but actually going for circular thinking, like all ecosystems, for instance, have loads and loads of cycles in them. An ecosystem couldn't exist without them because it needs to recycle all its nutrients. And uh, lastly, the to the comparability of natural ecosystems and socioeconomic systems, uh, one could say, well, if we know how ecosystems work, why don't we just take this blueprint and put it on the socioeconomic systems uh, so that they work better and are more resilient and persist over time? Uh, but it's not uh, possible to do really a one-on-one -on -one comparison. So they have some similarities. For instance, we can organize them in hierarchies from species to ecosystems and products to, uh, to, to companies or so. Uh, some goals are similar, for instance, both strive for resilience, ecosystems do it better, of course, uh, but differences are also that some goals are different. For instance, there's no profit maximization in ecosystems, uh, and the time frames are also very different. In ecosystems, we have evolutionary time frames, long time frames for adaptation, whereas in the economy, we actually don't have them. Okay? So also these different time frames, these different rates, uh, of at, at which things are happening need to be taken into account if we want to deal, for instance, with the SDGs um, as a system. But uh, the underlying message is we don't have ecosystem services without functioning ecosystems. So that's the first thing that we need to uh, look after. And uh, that concludes my talk. Thank you very much uh, for listening. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you very much, Ursula. And um, our time is almost up. I think we have time for one question. Does anybody have a question? Thomas, keep it short. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, thank you very much for this very nice talk, Ursula. I'm very happy that I could make it. Uh, I, I have this question about, um, you know, efficiency and uh, and sustainability. So you had uh, this diagram and you showed us the systems that are most uh, sustainable. They somehow lie in the middle of the efficiency axis. So great efficiency means low sustainability, but a small efficiency also means low sustainability. And I, I, I wonder why. And uh, that's the one thing. And the other thing I want to say in science, there is also the question, uh, so in the, in the academic endeavor is the question whether um, efficiency, uh, how much efficiency science can actually afford, because if we are too efficient, then uh, we stop exploring things. We stop exploring, uh, going in all directions and finding things. So I always say, give randomness a chance, you know, if you want to uh, discover something. Uh, what do you think about that? Yeah, absolutely. So to your first question, um, so we have uh, less sustainability if we're too efficient. Uh, in in uh, ecosystems, if we have too much resilience, then we actually um, uh, are, are not um, giving the, the, pred the, the top predators enough energy. Okay, so we need to have some efficiency uh, to for the energy basically to reach everywhere that it can. How it exactly that would pan out in eco uh, in economic systems, I'm not sure. I don't um, 
I don't know, know of an example of a completely inefficient economic system. It probably wouldn't survive, I suppose. And those, those that eat so on top of the, of the curve, uh, these are all ecosystems, but existing ecosystems. Okay, So implying that if you're too efficient or too resilient in an ecosystem, then the ecosystem actually doesn't exist. Okay? So what we measure are those on top of the curve. And in terms of your question for science, no, absolutely. So too much efficiency is not a good thing. We all know if we don't have time to think, then we then we actually cannot uh, think up new things, right? Then we then we can't come up, come up with new things. So randomness certainly has a chance uh, in in the scientific endeavor. I completely agree. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Ursula. That was really an, a very uh, inspiring talk and food for thought, I, I would say. And um, we continue uh, a look behind the scenes, you know, of uh, scientific endeavors. And on the 6th of December, you are invited to attend another lecture on capturing the anthropocene. And I've tried it, you know, when you, when you say it, when you say it, when you say it all over again, uh, it works. Uh, Anthropocene <laughs> dynamics from above, a remote sensing of terrestrial vegetation. So this talk is presented by Professor um, Onisomo Mutanga. So don't forget to diarise the 6th of December at our usual time slot from 5.30 to 6.30 p.m. Um, I would also like to take this opportunity to thank a few people. Uh, of course, Professor Shala for this uh, really engaging talk. Um, Dr. Sally Frost, who coordinated the event. Asok Araj, who presented the invitations and the wonderful backgrounds, as you can see here, with the fish. And of course, the countless people in the back who help spreading the message. So please remember to join us again on the 6th of December for our last talk this year uh, by Professor Mutanga. And please now, as it is custom, unmute yourself and give Ursula a, a really well-deserved round of applause. Well done. Thank you very much, everybody, for attending and listening to the talk. It was brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.